Wir sind hier an der Freien Universität in Berlin, am Cluster Languages of Emotion. Und ich habe die große Ehre, heute mit Professor Jag Panksepp zu sprechen. Herzlich willkommen. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to be here. When it comes to research, you're probably the most famous tickler of rats <laughs> in the world. <laughs> And last not least, you coined the term effective neuroscience. So to start with an easy question, what are emotions? Well, emotions are the way we feel in a certain way. Uh, it is not a sensory feeling like uh, the pleasure of a wonderful cake or the pain when you step on a stone. Those are sensory feelings. They're very important feelings. We also have very large bodily feelings. We get hungry. We get thirsty. If uh, we run an exercise, we run out of air. And these are also very important feelings. But on top of that, we have these emotional feelings. And the emotional feelings are very large bodily and brain responses to the world. And they are tell animals what is important for survival inside the brain. So it's not just outside sensory, it's not your internal receptors of your body, they are the needs of the brain, such as someone taking valuable resources from you and you get angry. That anger is a very basic response. It's the same as if an animal wants you for a meal and you have to run away and you're scared. That is built into the brain. So affective neuroscience is the scientific discipline that tries to understand the emotional feelings of the brain and how many are there, how are they organized anatomically inside the brain, what are the neurochemistries. The aim of affective neuroscience is to go to the very foundation of mind. Mind means experience, subjective experience. Mind at a fundamental lead level means some kind of volition. The system wants to do something. Mm -hmm. And the emotional systems want to do something. They want to hit, they want to run away, they want to caress like mother and child, they want to cry, they want to laugh. And we finally are at a moment in the intellectual history of our species where we can finally understand these biologically, as opposed to just verbally describing them. That's what affective neuroscience is. But the foundation of our emotional mind is primitive and is pre-verbal. It's pre-symbolic. Mm -hmm. It is symbolic in the sense that these are tools for living that enhance survival. So a good example is pain. Pain is horrible, but pain is our friend because pain allows us to survive. People that have a neurological disorder where they cannot fear or feel pain and fear pain, they always die young. Mm -hmm. At a very fundamental level, all mammals share the same emotions. The evidence is very powerful for that. On top of that, we have learning mechanisms and the learning mechanisms operate with the feelings. Inside the brain is like the Grand Canyon in reverse, <laughs> you know. Here's this object, not just a valley where you can see the evolution of Mother Earth. In the brain, you can see layers of evolution because what came first cannot be thrown away. It is always kept there in some form. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's pushed into a deep unconscious. Some parts are made larger because they're valuable for your kind of animal. But what is most ancient is in the middle of the brain mm -hmm. and farther down in the brain. What is more recent is more outside in the brain and higher up in the brain. Mm -hmm. So the basic emotions, the ones you're born with, we call them primary emotions. They are far down in the brain and they're in the middle. And we can almost tell which ones are more recent. 
Anger and fear came early. Sadness and joy and play came later mm -hmm. because they're higher up and they're a bit farther lateral. They go farther up in the brain. Anger and fear remain lower in the brain. I still remember the, uh, your critique at, at the word reward system. Yes. Um, and you mentioned examples that sound to me more like motivators from outside. The emotional system you're talking about is what we call the seeking system that was originally called the brain reward system. Mm -hmm. Now anyone that's really worked on these systems in the brain knows the brain has many reward systems, many good feelings. Mm -hmm. They are related in many ways chemically and anatomically, but they can be distinguished. So uh, the seeking system does many things. It looks for all resources. It does not give us the pleasure of food or the pleasure of water. It gives us the enjoyment of life, the enthusiasm to be in the world. At a very intense level, we would call it euphoria, the psychiatric disorder of overactivity of this system could be mania. Mm -hmm. You are so on top of the world that you'll do anything. All ideas seem good. All investments are wise. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the problem of excessive joy, mm -hmm. that you are not realistic anymore. So this system looks for resources for survival. That's its basic function because every organism has to move from here where it's sitting like you and I are and move and get water, move and get food. And you should not have a separate system for every reward, just having one general system that goes for all rewards and feels good. Looking for resources should not feel bad. So I guess we should emphasize that we are not just talking about animals here, yeah. or um, that we are talking about all animals, including humans. Including humans yes. And that's it. That's an evolutionary process that um, includes fear and anger and um, Seeking. primary emotions in every mammal every vertebrate. Mammal. Yeah. But as you go down into cold-blooded vertebrates, they do not show maternal care, many of them. So we mammals, we are mammals because we're dependent on each other. A sea turtle comes to a beach and it lays a hundred eggs. And then the little ones have to be nurtured by the sun, warmed and hatched. They come out to the world, they run to the sea without maternal care. All mammals need mothers, and mothers have to have the principle of care. And we call this system capital C-A-R-E. So there's a care system. We talked about seeking system and the care system. Are there others? Yes. First of all, the care system depends heavily on the seeking system. Mm -hmm. Okay? All the emotional systems are talking to each other. But the most primitive systems that all vertebrates have are rage, the way Walter Hess discovered. We can make reptiles angry and aggressive. They all have a fear system. And the most important part is under the amygdala. You know, most people say, oh, amygdala is the heart of emotions. That's not true. Mm -hmm. It connects it to learning, which is important. They all have a seeking system. So those three primitive systems every vertebrate has. But mammals, and maybe some alligators that take care of their babies in their mouth, but all mammals have a care system. It's stronger in females than males. It's a biological difference. We also, all the vertebrates have a lust system, sexual system. So those are the primitive social systems, lust, sexuality, and care. Mm -hmm. An evolutionary understanding of the brain indicates that the maternal care system grew out of the lust system. There, 
it has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And when you already have social pleasure of a reproductive sort, okay. why not use the chemistries not only for attaching to the pleasure of sex, but to the pleasure of a social relationship. So the chemistries of lust were modified and used for the chemistry of care. So it's a more subtle system. Mm -hmm. And then we really become more subtle. And the two systems that we mapped almost completely by ourselves are the last two. So there's primitive rage, fear, seeking, lust, all capitalized, reptilian, every vertebrate. Then we have maternal. Now you're in the mammalian realm. We also produce babies that are so immature that we have to take care of them, but they also have to indicate to us that they need us because they can't survive without us. So we have a love between mother and child, child and mother, the primal social bond that has to be of high quality if the child is to grow up psychologically normal. Without a mother, a child cannot, which cannot survive. And if they just have nutrition, it's not enough for to nourish the mind. Okay, you just mentioned play. This was the, the thing that surprised me most in your system. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't find it anywhere else in any other psychological um, emotion system. Where did you get that from, um, slash, mm -hmm. how did you get the idea to tickle rats? <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, we were studying play for 20 years before we ever had the idea of tickling a rat. Uh, when we had gotten a basic understanding of psychological pain, separation, distress, the source of loneliness and grief to depression, We said, now let us study the opposite side. It's like in a theater, you have two masks. One is crying and one is happy. So we wanted to study the mask of happiness and get behind it. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, well, what is the best way to understand that? And I said, it is to study play. And there was no science to play because people said it was too chancy, idiosyncratic. You could never bring it into the laboratory. It happens here and there, but you can't control it. Well, it turned out that with rats, who are not good for psychological pain, they're wonderful for play. And that's probably why they're wonderful, because they can live alone without much pain, and when you put them together, they're so hungry for play. The young ones begin to rock and tumble and run around, and you can study it as systematically as anything in science. And we were shocked how clear it was. So we studied it and developed measures for it, studied the chemistries that control it, studied the brain areas that mediate it, The sensory systems, the most important sensory system in a rat is touch. Mm -hmm. Probably the same as our little children. To have play without touch. You know, if you play with your two-year-old, you better pick it up and throw it and be physical. They love it. That's the best play. So I think touch is the source of play. Hearing is a form of touch and recognizing that hearing is a form of touch, a specialized touch. And when we look at our children, that's when they're playing, laughing more than any other time. So if you ask, where is human laughter the highest in the natural world? Forget about the artificial comedy shows and stuff. There's lots of laughter there. That There we're tickling with words, but in real play, we're actually tickling the body. We're touching it, we're chasing it, and uh, children love it. And we could study it in animals, and we could study the brain mechanisms, and finally there's many other people studying it. It took a long time. I think the first uh, 
many years we were completely alone and we could we were not even allowed to use the word play. <laughs> <laughs> the colleagues said this is unacceptable anthropomorphism, giving animals human feelings. And uh, we said, well, what do you want us to call it? <laughs> you know, and play is P L A Y and just for fun we called it the prominent ludic activities of youth. <laughs> P-L-A-Y. We cannot come into the world without tools for living. If you put us into the world as a blank slate, we will not survive. We have to have tools. And those tools have to tell us what supports our life and what can take away from our life. And that's what the emotions are. And the fact that psychology during the behaviorist era said we never even talk about them. Can you imagine that scientists would close the book on talking about things? Talking about the possible nature of the world. But this is what happened historically. We have brilliant men of extreme arrogance telling us what we could talk about and what we couldn't talk about. I was trained in that tradition and in my mind I said this is not right. You know, these are important questions. And we are denying some of the most important phenomena. So even to this day, most psychologists have le left the organism outside the door and they study the concepts that they have. Mm -hmm. And when I say the organism is still outside the door, it's because we're not ethologists. Ethologists said, let us study animals in the, in the real world. If we do that, then all of a sudden, the places where we only had words become real things. The main goal of affective neuroscience is to bring the organism back into the room, to discuss it realistically, to see that we are organisms. Yes, we're the smartest ones in town, <laughs> but we share the tools for living and if we don't really understand the tools for living, if we just focus on learning memory the way Kandel does, the way most learning psychologists do, and we don't spend time on the emotional unconditioned responses, we will not understand who we are. So that's the goal of affective neuroscience, to allow the other animals to teach us who we are.